Everybody, welcome to uh, our session today. We're thrilled to have our special guest with us. Uh, this young man right here, the only voice of the Nashville Predators since the team began playing the NHL in 1998, Mr. Pete Weber. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Pete, you by the way, let me mention, he is an eight-time Tennessee State Sportcast Sportscaster of the Year. And... Um, We'll get him to talk a little bit about the NSMA as well because our student chapter, many of you are members here, are hosting Pete today. But Pete, you've been here before. You were here just yeah. a few weeks ago for the arena naming, so welcome. Thank you. Well, with the Predators being involved in the Montgomery County Event Center, which will be housing Austin P, men's and women's basketball, and I'm hoping men's and women's hockey. That'd I think great. that will be out absolutely outstanding. Uh, I mean, if Tennessee State's going to start the hockey program and it looks like they're full speed ahead, I would absolutely love to see that. So, yes, and my other familiarity with Clarksville, uh, the last name's Weber. That is of German extraction. Uh, my wife and I tend to visit Silky's German re uh, bakery here on a pretty regular basis. As a matter of fact, I have assignments today as to what loaves of bread I'm to bring back to Nashville from Silky's. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the honey-do list does still exist. But uh, this is a great opportunity for me to find out where your thoughts are right now, particularly as a young man in the back wearing a shirt from the Indianapolis Colts. Now, in my history, which included 20 years in Buffalo, there was this guy named Frank Reich who backed up Jim Kelly and was responsible for the greatest comeback in both college and professional football history. Frank Reich. I hope you're a big fan of Frank's. Yes, I am. All right. Very good. And a great human being. And I can't wait to see them in a few weeks. Uh, I think my schedule is going to work out for that. Uh, just so you know, the comeback, Frank had it against Miami in college for Maryland. They were down by a tremendous amount, but came back to win in the fourth quarter. In the NFL playoffs in January of 93, the Bills in the middle of the third quarter found themselves down 35-3. Head coach Marv Levy said, well, you led the greatest comeback in college history. Why not in pro history here today? Well, the final score was Bills 41 and the, then the Oilers 38 in overtime. So uh, that was an incredible day that many people told, as many people were in the 80,000 seats that day as told me they were, that meant the capacity of then uh, Rich Stadium was roughly 255,000 people. So that <laughs> Same thing happened with Music City Mirror. Yes. That 60,000, 68,000 went to several hundred thousand yep. that day that witnessed that, for well, sure. Well, but it also did not include Frank Wycheck's wife, Sharon, who was so nervous she never saw him throw the critical pass mm. to start that home run <laughs> throwback uh, play going back the other way. All right, I want to ask Pete, We'll kind of guide this one along. I want to get into some things that we're talking about in the intro to sports communication class. And as mm -hmm. I asked you guys, first day of class, think of your first ever recollection with sports. What was it? Was it an athlete? Something you saw on television? Did you hear something on radio? So I'll pose that to you. Your first ever impression that sports made on you, what was it? This is really going to age me, okay? Because this athlete retired in September of 1963. But I grew up going across the dial at night to all the 50,000 watt radio stations, if you can remember those carrying sports, and KMOX in St. Louis. I was a Cardinals fan. Why was I a Cardinals fan? This guy, Stanley Frank Musial. And why was I so much in favor of him? Because they described his stance kind of like this, it was like a little kid looking around the corner at the pitcher. And that was pretty good. 3,630 career hits, seven batting titles, and uh, what, two World Series championships in his time, though none after, what, 1944, when the Cardinals beat a team that no longer exists, at least not in that state, the St. Louis Browns. They're now the Baltimore Orioles. Phil Wood could talk to us more oh, yeah. <laughs> about the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles, uh, to be certain. But it was Stan Musial who caught my, my fancy then. <clears throat> and then plus, I should say, Barry, Listening to those games, I could tell Harry Carey, Jack Buck, and Joe Garagiola Sr. were all having a great time on the air. 
I was very young right at that point. A few years later, I found out they were getting paid to do that. Wow, getting paid and having fun. So I thought, I'm gonna try to do that if I possibly can uh, in my professional life. And I didn't even know the phrase professional life at that point <laughs> in time when I was making that decision. But that's why I decided to go for this and I'm grateful to this day that I had those inspirations. Let's stay on that path. So yeah. how did you get started? What was your first broadcast? Take yeah. us through some of the early reps that you had. My first broadcast was entirely by accident. Uh, my senior year of high school, I injured myself, uh, pinched a nerve on my neck on a blocking sled in football practice, so I couldn't play that year. And I went ahead and signed on with the local newspaper to take calls on prep sports nights so I could get all the scores in the paper the next day. Well, ultimately, they sent me out to cover my high school, Costa High School. You can look it up, but it no longer exists. I was so bad they had to close. Uh, <laughs> but I go to one of their games, Costa versus Deer Creek Mackinac outside Peoria. And there were three broadcasts going on that night when I climbed up into the very cramped press box. And the guys that were sitting right next to me also happened to be the morning radio team for a Galesburg radio station. And it's 8.30 on a Friday night, and coffee was necessary to keep them fueled. Well, coffee can also cause you to take a trip across the hallway, <laughs> only in this case, you had to go down a ladder to an outhouse uh, mm. for relief they handed me the microphone. And so I did like five minutes of very impromptu high school play-by-play -play that night on the station. And it was funny in that that game was also recorded and played back the next morning so I could listen and hear how bad I was. I wasn't as bad as I thought, but not as good as I'd like to be. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of how I got my, my first break. And by doing that, as I go to college, uh, I graduated early because the manager of the radio station asked me if I'd be interested in becoming the sports director. So I was able to graduate midterm and take that job. And so it went on from there. And of course, we all know Pete from the Predators and is a great hockey broadcaster, but he's also had the opportunity to broadcast in the NBA, in the NFL, and years of minor league baseball experience. Tell us a little bit about working in, in those leagues yeah. and, and how that happened. And we'll get into a little bit on differences sure. when you prepare for hockey as opposed to NBA as well. Well, my high school experience where I was so bad they had to close the school, I guess that happened to me in the NBA too. Not with the Lakers where I got to fill in for a little bit with Chick Hearn, but I got the job with the Seattle Supersonics. And you go, the Seattle Supersonics? They haven't been around since 2008. That's how bad it was. Actually, that was a different story. Mr. Starbucks sold the team out to people from Oklahoma City, and that's how that team got moved. But I was lucky in that, from Galesburg, Illinois, doing the state high school basketball tournament, I had a guy on that Sonics team who had played in the tournaments I had done from St. Anne, a big guy, Jack Sigma, with the drop step. And so I got to be like reunited with him after he had gone to Illinois Wesleyan and got drafted, what, seventh overall by the Sonics. Um, football. <laughs> At Notre Dame, the student station did the games. Those turned out to be pretty good tapes. Uh, but I never did NFL play-by-play. -play. I did college play-by-play. Uh, at University of Buffalo, but I got the chance to do the color on the Buffalo Bills. And you go, wow, the Bills, great team right now. When I was doing the color, they had a very fortunate, <clears throat> excuse me, seven and seven, se or eight and eight season. And then I did a weekly TV highlight show on the Bills, Buffalo Bills Magazine. I don't know why we shot video. They went two and 14, two and 14, Signed Jim Kelly and went four and 12. We could have used slides and told the story just as well as any video. But that was where I earned my spurs and then got to do the color on what turned out to be uh, four consecutive Super Bowl teams. That was a, a, a great deal of fun to be certain. And then coming uh, to the baseball, baseball was the sport, as you heard, that captured my imagination at the outset. It was the last sport I got to do. 
Uh, because I was in Los Angeles with the LA Kings, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, the Dodgers were looking for somebody for their AAA club in Albuquerque. This was long before the Simpsons and Isotopes. This was when they were the Albuquerque Dukes, the Duke City, and I went there and I got spoiled. The team was uh, 94 and 38, hit 325, swept through the playoffs, Pacific Coast League champions, and I thought, wow, this baseball gig is easy. It wasn't too many years later I did a Buffalo team that was 55 and 89, so I got the other side of the story uh, right away, uh, the way that turned out. Now with the LA Kings, I did college hockey at Notre Dame, both for the student station and for the NBC affiliate there. And I was, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, but I was sending out tapes and cassette tapes, that's how advanced we were at that point in time, to all the NHL teams and many of the American League teams. And I thought nothing of it, but I have to at least touch base with them. I got a rejection letter, this would have been in uh, June, from the Los Angeles Kings general manager. In July, they called me back and said, hey, we've got an opening. Would you be interested? And all they were going to do was double my salary from Buffalo, but we have to take into account cost of living in California versus mm -hmm. Buffalo, New York. <clears throat> but of course, I took that job, and uh, that was a fantastic experience, which really has played in to me doing the Predators today. So, hockey was it? I guess third. You'd done basketball. Hockey football. was uh, yeah. The hockey was the third I got to do. Okay. Yeah, and I did a lot of hockey play-by-play, -play, uh, both in the uh, American League and when my partner on the Kings, <laughs> the weather situation in Southern California can be interesting. He got rained into his house and couldn't make it down to the Forum to do several games. So I got to demo my stuff there because I lived, uh, well, the, the Forum is located across the street from what is SoFi Stadium now. Then was Hollywood Park, the racetrack. And uh, that was... A great deal of fun to be able there to be do that, and not only was Bob rained into his house, so was the meteorologist for KNBC4. He couldn't get out either, and we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have FaceTime, so whatever forecast, uh, Dr. Frank Fields, his son is Stormy Fields, uh -huh. another meteorologist, uh, he would do it on the telephone, and boy did that ever sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so let's compare hockey mm -hmm. to basketball, to NBA, yeah. as far as preparation that goes into the, the two sports, because at least the pacing is similar. somewhat similar. Yeah, especially when, uh, when it was Paul Westhead coaching the Lakers. Yeah. And uh, then when he later on went into college basketball, I think his rule of thumb was you have to take a shot every six seconds. Yeah. So uh, in hockey, very, very similar. Uh, you're just preparing for more people in a hockey game than you are in basketball. Because uh, those, <clears throat> excuse me again, those Lakers teams played basically six, seven guys. <clears throat> in hockey, you're playing, and that time it was 17. So six defensemen, 11 forwards. Now it's 12 forwards, six defensemen. And uh, that's what you have to deal with there. So you get prepared. But the other thing, <clears throat> now the NBA was not like it is now. Not all the international names. Hockey already was. Uh, in our first year with the Predators here in 98, we had seven different languages spoken in the dressing room. Hmm. So you can imagine the pronunciations of the various players' names. But I knew we had broken through in the South when one night after a game I heard somebody yell at who the guy who was our leading scorer that first year, Sergei Krivokrasov, and also an all-star. Sergei! Hey, Sergei! How about an autograph? That's what I knew. <laughs> we had made it. Yeah, and, and I moved to Nashville in, in 98 as well and covered the Preds' first season at the uh, Tennessee Radio Network, the state yeah. network. And you said there were seven different languages, so yes. I, I came into the dressing room post-game getting commentary and sound bites, and I speak Kentucky, so they couldn't figure that one out either. So, But pure Kentucky. It was pure, very pure. Yeah. But I, I really appreciate some of the early Preds, and these guys were phenomenal. Pete, Terry, Chris basically taught us the game, all of us Southerners here in Tennessee and Kentucky, with the sessions they would hold, Hockey 101 before yeah. games, you'd go down, because we had no clue what icing or any of the rules were, we just wanted to see a fight, you know, and 
Uh, and that's still the case some days now but uh, with some fans. But they explained the game to us. And I just remember the guy that was so nice to me and helped me was Cliff Ronnie. Yes. Because he knew I had no clue what I was talking about when I would go in to try to get post-game sound. Yep. And he would just be very patient and talk me through it. But that And his son, who was born here, was drafted a few years ago by the New York Rangers. Ah, okay. Playing in their organization. Yeah. But talk about that first year because you had – a brand new fan base. We were rabid. We were ready to go, but we yeah. didn't know anything about hockey. Well, how rabid was it? Before the very first face-off in team history, game against the uh, Florida Panthers on October 10th, there was a standing ovation before they even dropped the puck. Uh, and that was something I can never, ever forget. It would have been nice if we had scored a goal that night. <laughs> but uh, getting shut out one nothing. But the next game got the first goal in team history. And how about this? I always wanted to be in on the birth of a brand new team. So there I was. Couldn't wait to call the first goal. I didn't get to. Anybody have a guess why? It was only awarded after video replay demonstrated. The puck would have gone into the net had the net not been dislodged. So Andrew Burnett scored it, and I didn't get a chance to announce it. <laughs> that was a bummer. Yeah. And uh, as I think back to the how rough it was early on for the team as an expansion team, but what really hooked me on hockey, mm. and if uh, let's get a show of hands as far as who has attended a hockey game before a Predators game. Okay. Oh, my. Wow. But it captured me the first playoff run. Being a big NBA, NFL sports fan, but to go into that arena that I've been in a million times, but to feel an energy like I've never mm -hmm. felt in my life playing yeah. Red Wings, that series. And it, I was hooked from there. So I think that well, happened to a lot me, of fans. People, the first home playoff game was Easter Sunday. Here we are in the Bible yeah. Belt. Nobody's going to show up. <laughs> well, all the seats were filled. It was so loud. I was grateful I had headsets on to protect my ears. That's how loud it got, and they won that game and the next against Detroit to tie the series at two games each. So right afterward, we fly to Detroit, and the next morning, I go to the newsstand and pick up the Detroit Free Press, and the Red Wings had just won two consecutive cups. And the headline of the Detroit Free Press said, series tied 2-2, panic in hockey town. <laughs> so they were able to make an impression early on. Didn't win the series, obviously, but uh, they... Uh, they made that impression as far as being competitive. Yeah, and that really changed things for the Preds with that, that playoff series with Detroit. <clears throat> Let's go back. I'm getting ahead of myself. As we're getting into Preds, and I'm yeah, getting that's excited. Right. <clears throat> Let's take us back to when you were in these seats as a youngster, yeah. high school or college. What's the best advice you ever received as a young broadcaster? Study, study, study and maybe not so much, I'm sorry, schoolwork, but the sport you want to do. And uh, if you could, could you go up some? Because so, we have to keep our masks off so we can talk and not spray you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but the other, I, I think the best advice I can give anybody is, yes, you have goals where you want to go. Let's say you want to broadcast a Super Bowl on Fox or NBC or ABC, ESPN. Keep your options open at all times. Keep your eyes and ears open. Listen for opportunities and take them as uh, best you can. And here's the other thing today. We didn't have this when I was coming up, but the <laughs> internet gives you so many chances to get in the reps that are necessary to be able to perform at this level or any level you're thinking about right now. And I th I'm going to recommend a book to you. Maybe you've recommended this art. Malcolm Gladwell, The Outliers. This is, book is about 10, 12 years old now, but it's, I, I see it still at Amazon. It talks about <clears throat> how many reps you need to become proficient at what it is you want to do. And Gladwell's book has many other fascinating parts to it. Uh, how many of you were born in the first quarter of the year? You have a tremendous advantage, as Malcolm Gladwell points out. Other than that, your parents should have held you back a year so you could be more advanced than your classmates. But he pointed that out, and he, I don't know why, but he grasped onto hockey, and he goes, Wayne Gretzky, 
January birthday, Marc Messier, January birthday. What an advantage that was for them, uh, particularly because Gretzky is so small physically, and yet he was able to excel because of his brains, because of the way he was taught by his dad, and because of the out-and-out -out skill he was able to direct. Uh, we had Wayne's younger brother with us with the Buffalo Sabres organization. Yeah, everybody knows <clears throat> Wayne's nickname, the great one? We called his brother Keith the good one. <laughs> not bad, but not great. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, go so at it that way. Let's, um, let's kind of stick in that early Again? broadcasting mode yeah. as far as getting advice. But what about getting a mentor, someone that can oversee, or yes. I've heard even some people use like uh, their board of directors, people that mm -hmm. they really count on that'll tell you the truth. Yes. And a lot of times mom and dad won't, they'll tell you how great you are. Oh, it sounded so good, but. Yeah. But who's pronounced five names? Yeah, yeah other yeah, than yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> and you never gave the score. But right. um, tell us about people you relied on early on that you really trusted the constructive criticism yep. to mold you into the broadcaster you are. And I was lucky mm -hmm. in my hometown of Galesburg, Illinois, you can look that up between Peoria and the Quad Cities on uh, I-74, was a, a great broadcaster who I think should have gone to the NBA, Bill Pearson. Bill was my mentor very early on. And I was lucky a couple of years ago, I was able to take him out to dinner in Thanks in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was able to locate him after many, many years. And boy, that was a long chat. I think we emptied the restaurant's supply of coffee uh, <laughs> before we were through our second course. Because we talked and talked and talked, but he was great for being a sounding board. And then later on, the guys I got my broadcast partners, Bob Miller with the Los Angeles Kings. They didn't think he would last. He started, he left the uh, University of Wisconsin after they won the national championship in 1973, and then he only lasted until 2017. Uh, so <clears throat> he was a, he had been a, and he's still a sounding board for me to this day. And then the guy who hired me uh, to come to the forum in Los Angeles was the director of broadcasting for the, the building in California Sports Incorporated, as it was known then, was Chick Hearn, Hall of Fame basketball broadcaster with the Lakers, who I actually had listened to when I was growing up in central Illinois when he was doing Bradley Braves basketball. It got to be so bad when Chick and I would sit together uh, at night, he, they would say, you know, look at Chick. He used to have to tell Pete to go to bed at night <laughs> on, the, on the Bradley broadcast. Uh, that's what happened there. So I, I've been fortunate to run into people like that. Gene Hart, longtime voice of the Philadelphia Flyers, showed me how to keep track of records and so on that I would need to have at my fingertips uh, and you never know which ones you're going to need as a broadcast unfolds. So yeah, I've been very fortunate in the, uh, the mentors that I have had. I hope I've been a good mentee uh, for them. We were just talking about in class last week, when you first try to do this, you can't stand the sound of your voice and how you get over that and <laughs> When you can't get reps because no one's going to hire you yet to do a game. Right. That's the catch-22. Yeah. What do you do? And I mentioned that, of course, Tony Romo is making a nice living now as a broadcaster. But he, uh, to get prepared to do the NFL broadcast, he would be the analyst broadcast the Madden video game. Yeah. To try to do that. What did you do early on? Did you turn the sound down and call the game off television just to... to I did that quite a bit. Yeah, yeah I, I did do that quite a bit, much to the consternation of my parents when I was still at home. <laughs> and then later on, roommates in, in various cities around North America. But I, I just felt I had to, just to get... And in some ways, that gets you over uh, self-conscious jitters. The other thing I would do to practice baseball when I was working in Los Angeles, the Dodgers, the Angels, and for that matter, the San Diego Padres, would let me take an open broadcast booth and mm -hmm. bring my mixer and produce it like a major league game and uh, do baseball that way. And that's what I was doing. It was a tape from one of those sessions that got me my first job in Albuquerque in 81. And we're about to, to get into breaking down the different positions in class, but there is a major difference in doing play-by-play -play for radio uh -huh. and for television. You've done both. Yeah. 
Explain the difference. In television, well, a couple of things there. You're, you're really a prisoner of the director uh, choosing which video shots are going to be out there because essentially you have to caption what the director puts up on the screen. In radio, and here we'll quote uh, the greatest of all time, Vin Scully, you are the painter, and if you want to be, you can be a true artist. As he always put it, you have the whole canvas, you have a palette of all the available colors, and you are able to paint the picture, and please do it as completely as possible. Some of that is changing a little bit now. I, on the weekend, I made a trip up to Bloomington, Indiana, see my son, and we had the uh, Cubs game on Sirius XM, and I noticed they were selling a sponsorship for the description of the team uniforms, brought to you by Sherwin-Williams. So you talk about getting into details now, and they're selling those. But Eli Gold on Alabama football says he can't breathe without it being sponsored. So that's <laughs> part of what we're getting uh, into right now. Uh, it's so important with television. Well, let me ask you, which do you prefer? I prefer radio. Why? I, I don't want to be a prisoner to what somebody elects to put up on the screen, that I have to talk about that. Uh, there are many things that develop around what the visual audience is able to detect uh, versus what we might see behind the play. The, with the COVID broadcast of the NHL, when we first came back in the summer of 2020, we had two video feeds to us. The overall television feed, and then we had what they called the All-12, All-12 players, the entire hockey surface, so we could see things that were going on behind the play. When we came back this January, we only had the television feed, and I really grew to dislike the local TV directors, because when we're on the road, we don't have our own, uh, who decide they're going to linger on close-ups of faces. It's kind of hard to describe action when all I see is close-ups on a face. I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, he's got something up his right nostril there. Maybe we should take <laughs> care of it. Uh, but uh, that sometimes uh, brought me toward that uh, conclusion. Early on, you and your partner, Terry Crisp, did the simulcast, right. as we just talked <clears throat> about in class. So your broadcast was on the Preds Radio Network, yep. Preds Television Network. How does that, your role as play-by-play -play change if it's a simulcast? Um, I'm still, and I looked at it this way, that then it was, what, Fox Sportsnet, and uh, we were on 99.7 uh, WTN, a 100,000-watt boomer, and more people would have access to that than they would the telecast. So while I didn't go whole hog into incredible description, I did... Uh, do more than maybe a, a basic telecast would. When I went to television only, I was back to a captioning situation. I felt like uh, after those games, I, would, I had cheated my employer. <laughs> television, radio, either one, when you're working with your partner, the analyst, it's different as well. <clears throat> yeah. Their roles are different <clears throat> on radio, yeah. television. Uh, explain the difference for your analyst. Yeah, well, and then I had to explain to Terry, <clears throat> when we go to a replay, I'm going to say roughly two-thirds of the audience can't see it. So there you have to still be descriptive as to what you're seeing, as to this on the right wing rather than as you can see. No, there's some people driving down the highway that can't see it, and they're <laughs> going to hate you for saying that. So uh, we were careful with our use of language in terms of doing all that, and really after a while, that just became second nature. With Terry Crisp, we keep talking about him, it seemed like the chemistry was so easy, it was there from day one, did, yeah, it, did it, was. it happen just like that? It was. Now, Terry had been a coach of the NHL beforehand. He had coached the Calgary Flames of the Stanley Cup in 89, and then was the first coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, he had done a lot of network color commentary, but uh, sometimes he wasn't so easy with the communication box back to the truck. Like he would be talking to the truck and thinking he was talking to the truck when, when in reality he had hit my interrupt button and knocked my <laughs> voice off the air and what people heard in the air was, okay truck, now let's go to whom we come back from spot. Uh, so that was about, well yeah, there was one night in New Jersey when he wants to do a, a telestration, and he is furiously 
pointing his finger, but it was not on the telestrator, it was on the monitor. So I had to point to him to get over there to the telestrator <laughs> and do it on that particular uh, video feed. But what a, what a delight to work with, an absolute delight. And he did not remember me interviewing him when he was with Calgary or with Tampa at all, which is fine because I don't think any of those interviews were particularly scintillating, but uh, we had an instant chemistry and to this day, I'm sure I will, when I'm driving back to Nashville this afternoon, I'll get a call from him. He is visiting his, uh, his three children, their spouses, and only 10 grandchildren right now out in British <laughs> Columbia. So he might be exhausted by the time we get him on the phone, but I have to take into account the time change. So when it's not natural, You've worked with other analysts, different places, even with the Preds now. Yeah. Is there any set formula of how long it will take? What do you try to do to really put this, in a lot of instances, former player or coach yeah. at ease? I try to not look like I'm uptight at all, that I'm as relaxed as possible to give them a chance of absorbing that attitude to it. Now, one night, uh, Terry got afflicted at our morning meeting with kidney stones. And so we took one of our scratch players, Jeremy Stevenson, and put him on the air. And I looked back at the video later, and much as I tried to calm him down. Now, Jeremy was known as a fighter in his NHL days. But when we came on camera, his eyes were like that. I could not really get him to relax. But he told me later he enjoyed the experience, but he much rather would have been down on the ice pummeling somebody uh, than doing I was happy he wasn't pummeling me, really, when you get right down to it. Uh, but, yeah, so every relationship like that is different. And she's on the Preds. I've worked with Terry, Stu Grimson, uh, Chris Mason, Brent Peterson, Jeremy Stevenson. Uh, there may have been some others on a single game sort of thing. Well, one night we had the captain, Greg Johnson, with us uh, in the booth in Florida, which was the only night Brian Finley, who had been one of our first round draft choices, ever played a game for the Preds. It was one he'll never forget because he gave up seven goals. So he got put in there because Chris Mason was supposed to start as he stepped on the ice, strained his groin muscle. So they had to dress as the emergency goaltender, a defenseman who had not played goal since he was six or seven years old, Jamie Allison. And as each goal went in during the course of that game, we took close-ups of Jamie squirming on the Predators bench. He was hoping against hope that he wouldn't get put in there and Barry Trotz saved him from that. <laughs> um, tell us about some, some games that you've had where you've had issues. You've talked about a few of those with, uh, let's talk about maybe equipment failure. Things go down and you're having yeah. to deal with some of those issues in, in any sport you've done. Well, one thing that we don't seem to have in hockey now is breakage of the glass. It is much sturdier than it was then. But one night in San Jose, we had a breakage each period during the mm -hmm. game. Uh, so you're, that's where you, I guess my baseball background came in to tell stories and to recall things that happened. We rarely, if ever, have those chances now in hockey. But the third glass breakage was really a horrible story of a horrible night for the San Jose Sharks goaltender, Steve Shields, who had been with me in Buffalo. The last glass breakage occurred with a shot that went into the San Jose bench area and shattered the glass and it went all over Steve's head. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's bad enough you gave up all those goals and now you've got to pick glass out of your hair, out of your, and hopefully, and none out of his eyes as it turned out. But uh, those things happen. There have also been, uh, you all familiar with the Zamboni, which resurfaces the ice between periods when they have broken down, and then you're filling time. One night in Buffalo, we had on April Fool's Day, we had a breakdown on the ice, and the, he was obviously driving the Zamboni while intoxicated mm. because he was zigzagging all over the place and finally they had to wait when he came down to the entrance and replace him with a sober Zamboni driver <laughs> to finish things up. But those interesting things can happen. In baseball, one night at the then new ballpark, and new was 1988, 
in Buffalo. The, their opening game there uh, was a win over Denver, and they had set the automatic sprinklers to go off after an afternoon game. Well, the next game was a night game, and they went off and drenched the starting pitcher for the uh, Denver Zephyrs the next night, like at 7.15. And uh, I think that was a great moment of hilarity because the guy who ran the music, the game operations staff, had queued up the song, the theme for the great TV show, Green Acres. Uh -huh. So as the water is spraying, we're hearing, Green Acres is the place to be. <laughs> Uh, and that was, uh, that was an interesting night. They finally, the groundskeeper was able to deprogram and turn off the sprinkler system. Basketball, I was at the Spectrum in Philly when Daryl Dawkins broke his second backboard mm. and the San Antonio Spurs were in town. My buddy was doing the San Antonio radio broadcast, Sam Smith, and he had to fill 45 minutes. He quickly motioned me to come down and tell old South Bend stories because that's where we knew each other from. But that was that after that night that the NBA mandated you have a backup backboard ready to mm -hmm. go. They had to go to the palestra and get another blackboard <laughs> or backboard to replace that one. Mm. Superstitions. We know athletes are. <laughs> uh, how about broadcasters? What uh, types of things have <clears throat> to be done or you need to feel like you can get through this broadcast? I don't like to eat before a game uh, because I don't want to take a chance on the culinary talents of those running the pregame meal <laughs> and think there might be some uh, bad chemical reaction within me, so I don't want to take a chance on that. That was a lesson I learned very early on in my career. Or as Crispy's favorite story about superstition was the national anthem. Every time I hear that, I have a bad game. So try to avoid that one. Uh, but there are players. Paul Correa always had to go to the bathroom before a game at 521 mm. each night for these 7 o'clock games. So it was up to the trainer to reserve a stall for Paul Correa, who's in the Hockey Hall of Fame now. And maybe that, who knows, maybe the 521 put him in there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I doubt it, but uh, that could have happened. Baseball. <clears throat> and I think baseball seriously is the most dangerous for superstition or running a, a foul of the superstitions. The guys that don't want to talk about hitting streaks because then it'll be over. The guys that don't want to talk about how well they've been playing. The guys who have been pitching very well. Oh God, please don't bring that up. Uh, <laughs> made for some interesting pregame shows. Okay, here's a guy who hasn't given up a run in five years. Uh, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah. so, so you have to be cognizant of what each guy has and maybe talk to them before the mic goes hot about what you're comfortable discussing. So how do you, you've been in this <clears throat> position with the Preds, their voice from day one, but yeah. how do you stay on top of your game? Do you still review yeah. your tapes, have other people <clears throat> listen? I listen to them and by the way, with all these post-game highlight shows now, I'm able to listen to them while I'm driving home. Yeah. Did I mess that up or did I not? And uh, excuse me for getting dings here. Um, it's Terry Chris, right? Actually, it's broadcast engineer Bob Horner. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, we were where again? Talking about uh, you reviewing your tapes oh, yeah. to this day still. <clears throat> so I, I mean, I record everything from the site so I can listen to it right away and also pick up and stash away whatever bloopers I might have created uh, that particular night. Um, I, I, I like a good crack up myself whenever, whenever possible. Uh, but listening to the tape, I won't listen to a full game, but I'll listen to a parts of the game I had questions about. We're going to get into <clears throat> the preparation side of things in the second session, but before we open it up for a few questions here, Again, several of the students mm -hmm. have just joined the National Sports Media Association. Okay. Uh, you've been a member, a great supporter of that. As I mentioned, eight-time winner of the Tennessee State Sportscaster of the Year. So they bribed me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that event because we've been able in the past to take uh, several of our students yes. to the conference each year. We always see Pete. Especially um, at the old train station in Salisbury. Exactly, right. Yep. 
But uh, kind of give the sales pitch for joining this organization and the opportunity to meet people like yourself and all and just very informal setting and you get to see some of the legends. Yeah, and for the most part, they all are very willing to share their stories uh, with you. Uh, one guy that I don't get away from at all is someone that you might know better as a NBA guy, Bob Ryan. But Bob Ryan from the Boston Globe <clears throat> first cut his teeth on covering minor league baseball. And he loves that more than anything. We, so when the meetings moved to Winston-Salem, he would go see Winston-Salem uh, play as soon as we got into town <clears throat> and take his notebook over there. He still has, and Phil, I don't know, do you still have all your score books? Yeah. Okay. Bob Ryan does. I have all the ones from when I was an official scorer. Okay, and that's a good thing to keep because who knows, 20 years after the fact, maybe somebody can get a no-hitter out of you. Well, I was the official scorer at 2130 for Ripken, so... Uh, okay, very good, and we just had the anniversary. Mm -hmm. Just had the anniversary of, uh, of that. Uh, man, and we lost our shortstop for that game, Bill Ripken, who was playing for us in the playoffs in Omaha. But uh, when he came back, that was, his eyes were still glazed over from all that went on for his brother. Uh, the scoring, and again, how often did your phone ring? Not that often. They were pretty strict in Baltimore about uh, uh, calling the official score during the game. After the game was a different story. Okay. The only guy who ever really called me during the game was Mike Pagliarulo. He had hit a routine one hopper to Glenn Davis at first yeah. base and hit off of Davis's glove, rolled into foul ground, and Pally Rulo ends up on first base. So it's it's clearly E3. Yeah. Well, the, the next half inning when Pally Rulo's back in the dugout, the phone rings, and it's him. And I said, you know, you aren't allowed to call me during the game. He says, well, I, you know, I scorched that ball. That's got to be a hit. And I said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll ask Glenn after the game. <clears throat> yeah. And so, and Glenn, who was a Bible thumper and, you know, he, 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 I, I asked him about that. He says, I make that play 99 times out of 100. He says, I, I botched that. So it's, it's staying yeah. there. So that, that season, Polly Rillo hit 279 instead of 280. So. <laughs> All because of you, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> All because of you. Not to mention the fact that the play was botched. <laughs> but uh, and in, no, in no game is the official score more important than it is in baseball and uh, more a focus other than maybe if you're an umpire at first base in Detroit and Galarraga has a chance at a perfect game or my all-time favorite growing up a Cardinals fan was uh, game six of the 85 World Series and Don Denkinger made the call of safe when Todd Worrell had gotten there and beaten the play and uh, I thought it was fitting that years later Whitey Herzog had a reunion of the 85 team, I think it was in 2015, and invited Don Denkinger. And Don was wondering whether he should go or not. And they said, go ahead, bygones be bygones. He got this gift box from Whitey Herzog and opened it up, and it was a very elegant watch in Braille. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way that goes. So he wasn't going to forget that at all. <laughs> You mentioned Bob Ryan, but yeah. are there any other people that, because you're in season, maybe the same time they are, that you finally had a chance to meet yeah. at the NSMA weekend? I had met him before, but never had the chance to talk uh, at length with Brad Sham of the Cowboys. But he's tremendous. And then he also told us about <clears throat> Mrs. Jerry, who was allowed to design much of the interior of Jerry's world, the AT&T Stadium. And uh, he goes, I wish Jerry hadn't done that. She put up a railing that was directly in the line of view from every broadcast position in the stadium. So we either had to stand up or duck down below it. Mm. So uh, yeah, that fun to meet him there. Uh, I was able to get Bob Miller out from Los Angeles for a Lifetime Achievement Award. I think that was our first year in Winston-Salem. Yeah, it was. And uh, go through so many other people there who, you know, they contact me. They, uh, and we, uh, maybe we do mentor-mentee back and forth a little bit. Matt LaPay, who was the voice of the Wisconsin Badgers. My wife and I were texting him while driving through Bloomington Saturday afternoon, listening to his broadcast of Wisconsin and Penn State. 
So again, uh, the NSMA, National Sports Media Association, if you want more information, you're not a member, just grab my business yeah. card. We're going to have our first chapter meeting coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks. This uh, Hall of Fame weekend I keep talking about takes place in December this year because it was canceled last year. If you've heard of uh, Michael Wilbon, Dan Patrick, uh, Dick Stockton, legends like that are going in the Hall of Fame. But then you have the state winners from every state are there. So if your favorite yeah. NBA team, their announcer could be there. But the good thing about it is for the students, there's a one-day seminar. We get to spend all day with people like Pete Weber. He mentioned Brad Sham, the voice of the Cowboys. All of the Hall of Famers have been so generous in years past to come in during this seminar mm -hmm. from Bob Costas to Chris Berman. So you get a chance to meet these people in those settings. So it's, uh, it's really cool when you get a chance to put them into your network and someone you can bounce things off, let them listen to your tapes and things like that. So if you're interested, just grab my business card on the way out today. All right, we've got maybe 10 minutes left in this session, so we will open it up. If you've got some questions, again, Pete's going to be back during Phil's class. We're going to get more into uh, Preds questions, state of the Preds, and, and more into some game prep. But any questions of Pete, anyone has right now, go right ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, so, when you, because I, I know this, um, I know when you transferred from doing like TV broadcasting to Preds Radio Network, um, did you give any advice to like Chris Mason or Stu Bimish when they came on to yep. TV broadcasting? Question, if uh, we couldn't hear it for our camera, but advice given as Pete transferred over TV to radio and the different analysts he's worked. Because what with. I did at first uh, with no matter who, was asked of what questions they might have of me, uh, what I was looking for from them. And so, because they were so professional, I didn't have to volunteer things for them. I was able to uh, answer their direct questions and go after it in that fashion. Uh, Chris has, I think, done a marvelous job transitioning to TV, and Stu Grimson still lives in Nashville, but he commutes to Secaucus, New Jersey, to do NHL network work. They are in the same uh, facility as Major League Baseball Network is. So you can walk down the hall and uh, change sports without any problem. But yes, I will talk to them. Yeah, I have a question, Pete. Um, when you went from Buffalo yep. to Nashville, Buffalo had a longer tradition of hockey yep. than Nashville did. And uh, I, I mean, as a student here many years ago, I used to go to the Dixie Flyers game. Yes. And, and they uh, started in 62, everybody. Well, so this is, I'm looking at 68, 69, yeah. 70. Um, the, um, the fans in Nashville weren't quite clear on, on, on hockey. And, and when the announcer would say, icing Nashville, they would stand and cheer. Yes. Because they thought <laughs> that, that must be something positive if they're right to announce. It should them. have been sponsored by a bakery, right? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's, uh, uh, I, I just wonder, our, our mutual friend, Ron Weber, who yep. the Capitals games for years, came into a market in D.C. that hadn't had hockey, and he essentially knew that he was there to essentially teach. Yes. Did you feel the same way when you yes. came to Nashville? Yes, and the reason I felt that way was because of my prior experience in Los Angeles. We were teaching new Kings fans about the game. Now, they had had the minor league version uh, there. Washington really didn't have much of that. And uh, so having spoken with Ron, and while we have the same last name, we're not related, uh, we talked about that a great deal. But I did so many luncheons and dinners in Los Angeles and Orange Counties talking to people and just essentially, I think that was where the genesis came from my Hockey 101 classes, getting the questions that they had at that point in time. Now the reason they put the Kings franchise in there, <coughs> our owner, <coughs> excuse me, the founding owner, get another drink here, Jack Kent Cook, a Canadian by birth, and he said, I found out there are 350,000 former Canadians living here in the Los Angeles area. And after a while, he goes, I didn't realize they moved here because they hated hockey. Uh, but uh, that, 
So that was what we were battling against. And we had great broadcast coverage in LA. We were on uh, A number one stations. Uh, radio was KRLA, a station that was owned by Bob Hope, the comedian. And TV was KHJ, now KCAL 9 in Southern California. And uh, we did 20 to 25 simulcasts a year, which was another uh, event altogether. Uh, no, I bring it up because as, as a broadcaster, in the back of your mind you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to people who are already fans of this. Yes. Story, and that wasn't the case. Right, right. With the exception of those people who have moved down from Michigan for the Nissan and Saturn plants, mm -hmm. and where we got the, the Predwing fan label for all of them, and we, uh, they, they seeded the stands. They were the ones who really got things rolling and then going off sort of uh, anti to them. Uh, in Detroit, for many years, going back to the early 50s, when the Red Wings were very, very good, and in the process of winning seven consecutive regular season titles, the Cusimano brothers had a fish market. <clears throat> and they thought it would be great <clears throat> if, back in those days, you only had to win two series to win the cup, eight wins. So they came up with the idea of an octopus. Eight tentacles, eight wins, throw that on the ice. <clears throat> Our fans, after seeing us in Detroit and the octopi flying onto the ice, decided they had to do something localized. That's how the catfish tradition got started. And how one Predator fan who went to Pittsburgh during the cup final run of 2017 got arrested for throwing a weapon, I'm trying to remember how it was termed, uh, a weapon of disruption onto the ice at PPG Pates Arena. And uh, so that's another tradition that now is forever here. Now, in 2010, somewhere around there, a young lady was struck by a puck in Columbus and lost her life a couple of days thereafter, and they began to put the nets up behind the goals. Our one fan had this 15 to 20 pound catfish he wanted to throw on the ice at Bridgestone Arena, not taking into account that netting. <laughs> so he tosses it and it lands splat in the lap of a couple uh, right behind the glass. So they've had to be a little bit more careful and I guess I should have done a Hockey 101 class on catfish throwing <laughs> yeah. at, at that point in time. And to stick with COVID protocols, the, the catfish, we saw a yes. few make it out on the ice with the actual mask on the catfish, the few fans that got in last uh, And one of the season. ice girls had a bet with her brother that she would not kiss a catfish on the lips that she had gone to pick up off the ice and take off. That was one big ugly catfish, but she got the money from her brother. <laughs> Other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Spencer. I was just going to ask, do you have a favorite call from just like any sport that you like, uh, just have like a memory of? Uh, there are several. One that I will never forget, it was baseball. We were in the process of, we thought, winning the American Association Championship in a playoff with Denver. Had won the first two games at home, lost game three, this is a best of five, and in game four, we go to the ninth inning down nine nothing and being no hit. 32 minutes later, what should have been the tying run was called out at the plate. And I lost it. I lost it badly at that point in time. That stands out to me. Uh, <clears throat> the Bills beating the Raiders 51-3 to go to their first Super Bowl in January of 91. Uh, Marv Levy, our head coach, was a great student of history. That was his degree from Harvard and a great admirer of Winston Churchill. So I paraphrased Winston Churchill when it was 41-3 at halftime. And I said this, ladies and gentlemen, will give uh, tribute to Winston Churchill, is the Buffalo Bills' finest hour. In many ways, it was. <laughs> and then, uh, I guess, hockey here would have to be Mike Fisher's triple overtime winning goal in 2016, uh, where there are various exclamations around me on different microphones, uh, primarily because Terry Crisp was not on TV that night. You're to that point in the playoffs, local television does not have access to it. So he was up standing behind me and Brent Peterson, who was doing my color that night. 
He hugged Brent Peterson so hard, I think he broke, to, broke a few ribs. <laughs> and you can hear all the air leave Brent Peterson's body. And you can kind of hear in my call, ah! <laughs> and that, so that was, uh, that was kind of entertaining for me. Yes? Now I have a follow-up about that uh, Pittsburgh uh, weapon yes. disruption incident. Uh, what exactly was their weapon of choice and why did they do it? No, it was just the catfish. It was the yeah. catfish that was thrown out on the ice. Why did they do it? Did they do it just for fun? Or? Oh, yeah. To show fervent fandom, I think, would be the best way to put that. And that was, uh, <clears throat> then he was immediately locked up. And I think they were asking for the death penalty. Uh, <laughs> But we were able to get him out. <laughs> the ice kept the fish fresh, so. Yes, very. <laughs> so if PETA was concerned, yes, sir. Um, so it's like sports broadcasting uh, sees like the industry is changing to where professional athletes are starting to get <clears throat> more of the jobs. Yeah. So what can a sportscaster that's not a professional athlete do to kind of stand out? I would say stick to play-by-play -play or hosting because most of the ex-athletes become the color commentators. There aren't too many who have become the play-by-play -play people. But I think, and that's why, when I was with the Kings and I was the color commentator, I'm going, I'm not an ex-athlete. And, and Jack Kent Cook was, he had never hired an ex-hockey player to do color on the Kings games. So I was grateful for that. But uh, then I, when I had the chance to take the Seattle Supersonics play-by-play -play job in the NBA, I took it because of those very thoughts and I knew that my partner Bob Miller was not going to go any place very soon, and indeed he did not for 37 years. All right, one more if anybody has one. Yeah. Um, so for women getting into sports broadcasting, yep. it says that it is a male-dominating career. Is yes. Is there any advice you have for women, or do you feel like they have to prepare more for their roles in sport broadcasting than men do? I think the person who can answer that best for you is Laura Oakman, who lives in Nashville, and uh, she's a Fox sideline reporter, and she has a group called Galvanize. You can follow her on Twitter, and if need be, I can pass along her Twitter handle to you. She can give you far better advice than I could possibly. But yes, study, get in your reps, and then see what Laura has to say. All right, we're going to wrap this session up. Again, on your way out, if you want a free pen from the department, if you need any information about joining our NSMA student chapter, grab my business card. If you want to go to London, to Wimbledon, and the British Open next summer, grab a flyer and check out my study abroad class. Thanks to Pete Weber. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you.